collection. So it's been a while. And welcome back to the channel. It's a lit life with Miranda Reads, and today we're going to do a deep dive into the fairy tale files of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. My very first remembrance of this story happened in the third grade. I was sitting crisscross applesauce, the teacher just finished the last page, and this little girl turned to me. And excuse me for paraphrasing because it has been a while since I heard her say this, but essentially what she said was, Did you know that this story is real? All of those kids really did die. Cue the greatest existential crisis of my third grade life. And as that realization th swept through the third grade classroom, the teacher frantically at the front trying to calm everyone, the lunch bell rang and it was all forgotten, except by me. I have always wondered, is that story true? And today we're gonna find out. Part one, the story. The Pied Piper of Hamlin is a classic fairy tale. It's not as common as The Ugly Duckling or The Three Bears, and it hasn't been sanitized by Disney like Frozen, Tangled, Snow White, etc. However, this story has been carried through time and time again in those classic bound books of fairy tales. While the story has changed over the years, the core concept of it remains pretty steadfast. In Hamlin, Germany, in the Middle Ages, the town was infested with rats, which Adorable as pets, not so adorable back then. There is a Pied Piper who comes to town, Pied referring to a multicolored clothing and Piper referring to the instrument that he plays. And he agrees to rid the town of rats for a price. And so he begins to play and all the rats scurry out of the town and they follow the Piper into the river where they drown. And depending on the version, sometimes the townspeople promise him money that they don't have and they literally cannot pay him. And sometimes the townspeople were greedy and they were banking on the fact that the rats are dead as a way for the Piper to not have anything to threaten them with if he doesn't get paid. Either way, the Pied Piper leaves town and the whole story is over. Just kidding. He comes back. It depends a little bit on which version you read, but what is universal is that the Pied Piper comes back and this time he is not looking for rats. From the one I remember and the one that seared itself into my memory is that he came back while all the adults were in church. And this time he was wearing green, which was significant because at that time, hunters wore green. And when he began to play his pipe, it was not the rats that followed him out of the town. It was the children, 130 children in all, out of the city they went into a hill and that hill sealed itself behind them. A lot of the stories will have some children remain behind to tell the tale. The one I remember had a lame child who could not walk fast enough to keep up and a blind child who could not see where to go. But depending on the version, there might be a deaf child who could not hear the music or a nursemaid who physically held back her charge to prevent that child from joining. And again, this is another thing that seared itself into my memory, but both children were sobbing. They were desperate to foul the Pied Piper, which when you combine that with what that girl said to me in third grade where all the kids really did, I connected it in my mind and it was the children who were left behind were begging for death. They would rather be dead then continue on without the Pied Piper. And like that like really freaked me out as a kid. Whew, intense, right? <laughs> but this begs the question, what if any of this is true? Part two, tracing the story through history. Like most folklore stories, you can often trace back the fairy tale that we hear today to a few core versions. It really helped kick off the popularity. For the Pied Piper, most historians seem to agree that the three main versions that brought it mainstream would be Robert Browning's The Brothers Grimm and Johann Wolfgang von Gio. I took Spanish in high school, sorry. Let's journey back to the 1800s, specifically 1842, when Robert Browning published his dramatic lyrics, which contained the poem titled The Pied Piper. While Browning was not the very first person to publish on the Pied Piper, a lot of the elements of his story make it into our modern retelling. 
Among Browning's poetic flair are the familiar elements. There is the rat infestation, the Pied Piper's promise, the villagers going back on the promise, and then the children being led away. Of particular interest is the description of where the children are going. Specifically, the child that was left behind, this one being the lame one, was describing to the villager where all the other ones went, and it was a heaven of sorts. And all the other children would be of perfect health. There'd be food, there'd be water, there'd be sweets, happiness. Now that the child could not follow the other ones into wherever the piper was leading them, the lame child is now forced to live with imperfect health and the rest of his lifespan within Hamlet. Adding to the mystery, there is a twist at the end involving Transylvania, of all places. Essentially, there's a few lines that seem to indicate that Transylvania has an odd sort of people who colonize or settled in that area, and that might have been where the piper led the children. While this could suggest that they were spirited away to a new place to colonize, I still feel like the word choice of Robert Browning is rather dark. Specifically, he refers to where they go as a subterranean prison, which I feel like that's ominous in and of itself. But also, the act of entering the prison was through trepanning. Trepanning refers to using a trepan to scrape a hole in the skull to relieve headaches or evil spirits or what have you. And it was more common in the Middle Ages. It's not so common anymore. In a hopeful interpretation, trepanning is just referring to that they drilled into the hill for some reason and that's how they went to Transylvania. But that being said, the word choice does make me lean to darker rather than lighter. Another item that I thought was rather distinct with Robert Browning is his commitment to detail. I read a lot of fairy tales that are once upon a time, land far, far away. Robert Browning immediately grounds us in reality. Specifically, we are in Hamlin Town. It is 1376. And we have three points of evidence. Specifically, there's a street that you're no longer allowed to play music on. There is a uh, column that has an inscription as well as a stained glass window. These are all things that when he wrote the poem may have been verifiable to someone who is interested in determining whether or not this is a true event. We can trace the Pied Piper story even further back, specifically to 1816 with the Brothers Grimm. They are known for traveling across the German and European countryside collecting fairy and folk tales that were spread through word of mouth back in the day. So the Brothers Grimm combined the local folklore of the Pied Piper into two stories, specifically the children of Hamlin and the Pied Piper. Their story was much more concise than Browning's. It did have the same elements. We had the Piper, the rats, the promises, the promises that weren't kept, and then eventually the children taken away. There are some differences though. Specifically, instead of happening in 1376, this story actually happens on 1284, St. John and St. Paul's Day. We also have the introduction of the Pied Piper changing clothes and wearing hunter's green, and a surprising overlap where the children were taken to Transylvania. So this kind of bleeds credence to the children were taken away, but also given somewhere else to live. And finally, the other really popular version of the tale was Johann Wolfgang von Gioth's and he had a poem in 1803. Well, I'm not going to delve particularly deep into this one. Um, I do want to know that it was unique because it's told from the perspective of the Piper, and he's kind of being played off as a womanizer or a friendly guy, and everyone just kind of loves him, and it's just such a different tone from the other two stories. That being said, we still have valuable information gathered from the three stories. There's the overlap of themes, the rats, the Piper, the wooing of the children, what is quite interesting that comes from the Brothers Grimm tale is that it gives us a peek of what the living memory of the people of Germany was at that time. This event, if it did occur, was so traumatic and so long lasting that even hundreds and hundreds of years later, well, okay, it's just hundreds of years later, but the people still are passing this story from person to person. From there, I moved back to Browning's story. To me, Johann Wolfgang's was a little bit more of a fan fiction, a little bit more like, woo, Piper! While Browning's story was really focused on these details that you could look up and double check. So I wanted to know where he got them from. And then after a bit of digging, I realized that many historians believe that Robert Browning took his information for the Pied Piper 
from a particular 1605 rendition, which is also the first English language version of the Pied Piper by Richard Rowland. And it is in a book, and excuse me, I'm going to read this off of my laptop because I have tried saying this a million times and I cannot get it right. A restitution of decayed intelligence in antiquities concerning the most noble and renowned English nation. That's a mouthful. Admittedly, I declined to read the entire book, but I did find mention of the Pied Piper on page 85. In this version, we do have quite a few overlaps with Brownings and even the Brothers Grimm. We start off with the rat infestation, and then the Piper promises to take them away. The townspeople promise him money. The Piper takes them away. The money is not given. The Piper comes back and takes the children. Again, we have reference to Transylvania as a place where the children were taken. We have mention of 130 children taken through the gate by the Piper. And we have the mention of the date 1376 as well. While these stories may differ slightly in details, the overlap of it is quite consistent considering there's several hundred years between them. And while we have gone as far back as we can in the stories written in English, that doesn't mean that's where everything ends. There's actually quite a bit of physical evidence that we will be entering into next. Part 3. Hamlin. Arriving at the town of Hamlin, Germany, we have a place steeped in history, mystery, and intrigue. Originally, it was established as a monastery in 851 AD. However, in the 12th century, it became a village and today boasts a population of 55,000 people. And quite usefully, it has a historical museum that has quite a bit of information gathered about the Pied Piper. And historians have been interested in this story for hundreds of years. So they have been documenting all kinds of little bits of information that we can piece together to figure out this puzzle. There is a series of buildings with plaques on it dedicated to what happened to the children. There is the Pied Piper House, known as the Rottenfinger House, that was constructed a little bit before 1605. And then engraved on that plaque is a reference to 130 children being taken away on St. John and St. Paul's Day in 1284. And it references the children being taken away to a coven, which is also a knoll slash a hill. Another house known as a wedding house, which was used for celebrations, bears a similar inscription where it refers to 130 children being taken away to the hill. And then that brings us to the town gate. This gate was originally made in 1531. However, a second inscription was added on in 1556. The inscription talks about how 272 years ago, the children were let out of the town. Notably, if you subtract 272 from 1556, we get 1284 again. However, the museum's website does mention that if you subtract 272 from the 1531 number, you get 1259, which is the Battle of Stiedemunder, which, put a pin on that, we'll come back to that one when we get to the theories. This gate now resides in the Hamlin Museum, and the officials at the museum say that it is unclear whether or not this gate was more of a touristy thing or it was an actual memorial to the lost children. One thing that's important to remember is that while these buildings are constructed with these engraved memorials and while this town gate was made with the other engraving, these things are being made in the 15 and 1600s, which are still a couple hundred years after the events occurred. So any of the people who were working on these buildings were not alive to see what happened. All right, so now we have part four, the remaining evidence. As we journey back in history, we are now in the mid-1300s looking at the Lundberg Manuscript, also known as the Golden Chain, written by a monk named Henrik von Herfrod. While this was written in the mid-1300s, there was an inscription added in a different handwriting from the rest of the book in 1430 to 1450 according to what historians agree upon. And upon this paragraph becomes some written evidence describing what may have happened. The description is succinct. It doesn't have the rats. It doesn't have the swindling townspeople. It doesn't even have Transylvania. However, it does say on 1284, Feast of St. John and St. Paul, a handsome man came to town with a silver pipe, lured 130 children away. The mothers looked everywhere, could not find them. This little paragraph mentions that this story comes from Dean Lund's mother. Dean Lund refers to Johann de Lund, and he was the Dean of Hamlin, and he was a pretty well-known person of the town, whose mother, or possibly another female relative, was the witness to 130 children being taken away from town. He is said to also have a chorus book which had a few lines about what happened 
to the town written on it, but that course book has been lost to time and it's unable to be confirmed. Delving even further back, there is a town chronicle published 1384 with the quote, it has been a hundred years since our children left, implying that whatever happened, happened in 1284, which aligns with quite a few other fairy tales. Now the significance of this is that there's theoretically some sort of generational overlap, or at least a very close gap between the people who witnessed what happened and the people writing this chronicle in memorial. However, this item was pretty difficult for me to confirm. I do see a lot of historians quoting it, a lot of, I would say, pretty credible sources mentioning this. However, I've yet to see it in with my eyes. And additionally, something a little bit interesting is that when the Museum of Hamlin talks about the evidence for this event actually occurring, they don't mention the town ledger. Now the last bit of evidence, which is the earliest bit of evidence, is the stained glass window in the St. Nikolai slash Market Church. The window was made to commemorate the loss of the children in the 1300s, and it was restored in 1572, but later destroyed in 1660. So you might be saying, like, well, why are you talking about this? Because it existed for several hundred years, and people wrote down what it looked like. like there is a man dressed in pipe clothing with a pipe, leading children away dressed in white. There was also an inscription written on the stained glass window. And in 1592, Augustin von Mosberg was so excited, intrigued by this story, that he had someone make a watercolor painting of the stained glass window, which now that it's destroyed, we at least have an idea of what it looked like. And again, there was an inscription in the window saying that on St. John and St. Paul's Day, 130 children were led away by the Pied Piper. In case you're curious, the, while the church doesn't have that window anymore, they did commission a new one to be made in the 1980s, which does depict a Pied Piper around children as well. Before I forget, I wanted to cover Browning's poem and his evidence. He talked about the stained glass window, he talked about the column, and he also talked about the street where you could not play music on. And when I looked up those items, obviously we already talked about the stained glass window, so that was real. Um, the street you cannot play music or dance on. Uh, there seem to be several sources that agree that it's that street. And finally, with regards to the column, I didn't find anything specific about there being an engraved column, but part of me wonders if that might be in reference to the gates, possibly, where they taught the inscription added on referred to the Pied Piper. So I think the evidence all matches up, probably. Part five, the theories. Having unraveled this tale as far back as we possibly can go, I do think that we have enough evidence to assume something happened. And it's not just me who's thinking that. Historians for literally hundreds of years have been trying to guess what happened to the children. Which brings us to four main theories. Theory one, choreomania, aka the dancing plague. One plausible explanation for the disappearance of the children is known as the dancing plague. This condition is considered a form of mass psychogenic illness or epidemic hysteria, where certain behaviors such as dancing is spread throughout a crowd with no discernible reason, as in no organic or virus or what have you. And this happened often enough in the 12th to 17th century that historians agree that it did happen. For example, in 1237, there was a group of children that was documented to have danced 12 miles from Erfurt to Ardenstadt in Germany. Another incident happened in 1278 when a group of people danced across a bridge over the River Meuse and then that bridge collapsed and they all fell in. Now, some historians think that the dancing plague is purely like a social pressure, social construct, and that's the only explanation for it. However, other people believe that there might be a more medical reason behind it. Okay, so one example is Sydenham chorea, which is um, caused by the same bacteria that causes rheumatic fever. However, this is like an offshoot of symptoms that primarily affect children ages 5 to 15, and it causes these jerky, uncontrolled movements that kind of can be interpreted as dancing. Another option would be ergot poisoning, which is a fungi that can infect wheat and other grains. And if ingested, will cause hallucinations, kind of uncontrolled movements, slightly dancing-like. However, both this and the other one don't account for all of the symptoms displayed by the children. Often these medical explanations will have other more significant symptoms that you will see afflicting those who are affected. 
Revisiting the stories, we should consider that the children are often said to disappear on St. John's and St. Paul's Day. So St. John's Day was known for folk music and dancing, and in fact another name before the dancing plague was St. John's Dance. So some historians believe that's literally all that happened. A piper came to town, the children were swept up by the music, and off they went. And that's theory one. Which brings us to theory two, natural causes. Another possibility for the children's disappearance would be natural causes, so disease, starvation, or a natural disaster. The Black Death, known as the Bubonic Plague, swept through Europe in the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, and while the time frame that this peaked was not the time frame that most historians seem to agree that the children left, it does allow the possibility that some sort of disease came in and swept through the village and took the children with it. Rats have long been association with death and disease, and while they weren't included in the earliest mentions of the Pied Piper, their later inclusion might be more of a symbolic association of disease with what took the children. Additionally, the Museum of Hamlin cites leprosy as a possible cause because at that time it was common to gather up lepers and send them out of a town to form their own colonies. So again, we have 130 children being pushed out into the world. Another idea revolves around the tale mentioning that the children quite often go to a hill or a knoll or go within a hill, and that could be referenced to like a sinkhole opening up or perhaps a landslide that came through and took the children with it. In these interpretations, a Pied Piper would not be a literal figure, but more of a symbolism for death. An artistic theme that was quite prevalent in the late Middle Ages was the dance macabre, or the dance of death, and that would be literally death dancing with whoever he's taking with them. Now while this was popular later on in the Middle Ages, that doesn't mean that it just sprung into appearance there. It could have appeared earlier. Nevertheless, the natural disaster, the natural causes combined with the symbolism of the piper and death could be the correct explanation for this story of its real life origin. Which brings us to theory three, the bat. Now, if you remember the bit about the gate, that it was originally constructed in 1531, and if you subtract 272 from that number, you get 1259. Now, in 1259, there's the Battle of Sidemunder. The details for this battle were a little hard to track down. However, most historians agree it was between the bishop of Minden and the town of Hamlin. The bishop bought essentially the rights to the town. The townspeople did not like that. They wanted their independence, and so they went to war. The townspeople sent their youth, their young adults, to fight, and the bishop had his standing army, or whatever it was called back in the day. The battle ended with a very firm defeat of the townspeople of Hamlin, and the bishop of Minden retained control, though they ended up negotiating a bit later on. That being said, in this case, the piper would not be a literal piper, but more so someone who is rallying the youth to fight for their village and then led them to their deaths. I will say that there is a slight discrepancy in the date whether or not the Battle of Sudamunder happened in 1259 or 1260, but I'm not going to like split hairs. Another suggestion that has been poised is that the children or the young adults were recruited to fight in a military campaign or perhaps another children's crusade, but there wasn't much in terms of documentation for that as an evidence, but it is another theory along with battles. Theory four, emigration. So this is probably the most boring theory, but it also, according to historians, might be the most plausible, and that's immigration. If you remember from the more popular versions of the Pied Piper way back at the beginning of this video, we talked about how the children kept going to Transylvania, of all places, which I thought was very, very random. However, historians have said that that's a possibility, maybe not specifically Transylvania, but that the children were recruited to go other places. Hamlin at that time was noted to have a surplus population, and being a walled city would have some issues with resource and expansion. Now, looking at the historical context, Bishop Bruno lived about 10 miles outside the city, and he was known to send recruiters to various villages nearby and convince people to try and pick up their stuff and settle on a new village. After all, it wasn't too uncommon to refer to anyone born in a village as a child of the village. So when they're talking about the children of the village leaving and being led away, that could just be people leaving for real. 
Additionally, there are parallels noted between city names and also family names, almost some cases in a line as you go further out east away from Hamlet. And this is noted by historians Wolfgang Wan, Ursula Suter, as well as the, lingu as well as the linguist Jürgen Udolf. So the overlap in the new cities, as well as the family names, seem to indicate at least some people from Hamlin moved out in that direction. And I have one last theory, theory five. Um, after I talked this over with my mother, she wanted to include her idea of what happened, and it is aliens. She specifically cites how the talks about the children were taken, how the Pied Piper was mysterious, and he had mysterious control, and throwing it out there, it might be aliens. <sighs> I really enjoyed making this video. You have no idea how long I've been sitting on this idea and then how much time I've invested in researching and finding primary sources and how excited I was to make this for you all. This is something that's been fascinating me for literally decades at this point. So I'm really happy to have had a chance to compile all this information and present it to you all. That being said, I am curious, do you all think that this was a real thing that happened? Do you think 130 children were taken from the town of Hamlin in the 1200s to maybe 1300s? Or do you think that this is just a story? Additionally, if you think it's real, which theory is the most plausible for you? Personally, I do like theory one where it's as literal as possible where the children danced away, but I kind of think the last one, the immigration theory, is probably the most likely. At any rate, no matter what, if it was real, the children are dead dumb. Thank you all so much for watching and happy reading. Until next time. Bye.